I was reminded this week of an old preacher's joke. A little Sunday school, a little um, boy comes home from Sunday school and says, Mommy, Mommy, guess what I learned this week? I learned God's first name. Do you know what it is? Andy. Andy walks with me. Andy <laughs> talks with me. Like I said, it's an old preacher's joke. Our second scripture this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to follow along with me as we listen for a word from the Lord. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We begin this week a new sermon series that uh, we are calling uh, Family Issues of Biblical Proportion, because you are not the only one. So I wanted to start, does anybody remember the good old days? You know, back when times were simpler and life wasn't so busy and uh, everybody didn't have a cell phone and there wasn't so much trouble. For some, the 1950s represent the good old days. People remember the times as if most families were like the Cleavers on Leave it to Beaver or the Andersons on Father Knows Best. Families that consisted of a happily married couple and a mom who stayed home to cook and clean and care for the kids. And dad went off to his 9 to 5 job to provide for the family and the children were well behaved even if slightly mischievous at times. These families seemed idyllic, whether in real life or on TV, families seemed to be happier and healthier. Sure, they may have had problems, but they were all relatively minor problems that could be easily resolved in the half an hour episode. Things like, not, uh, like learning not to throw a ball in the house, or problems with grades, or lying, or sibling rivalry, or who to take to the school dance, or who scratched the car. But in reality, we all know that families weren't so perfect, even in the 1950s. Families faced the same issues that we have now. The difference is that they just weren't talked about back then. People still struggled with mental illness, except for it was referred to as being a little funny in the head. Drug use was still an issue. In fact, some drugs were developed and gained popularity in the 50s, which led to the big outburst of drug use in the 60s. For example, amphetamines became known as mother's little helpers because they were popular among housewives. Now, I'm not trying to pick on the 1950s or say that they were a terrible time. They certainly weren't. They were a wonderful time for many people. But I think they have come to represent that idyllic family because TV happened at the same time and were represented by people like the um, Cleavers that became that perfect ideal for us. But we know that no time in history has been perfect. Since the beginning of time, there have been no perfect families. All the way back to the Bible, we see dysfunction in families. So for all you parents out there, you can rest assured that sibling rivalry is completely normal. In the very first set of brothers, one of them kills the other. And then Jacob steals his older brother Esau's birthright and blessing. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. We also know that marriages weren't perfect. Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, the one who makes that first covenant with God, endangers his wife Sarah twice by lying and allowing her to be taken first into Pharaoh's harem and then into Abimelech's harem. Sisters end up married to the same man, competing for his love. Samson's wife was given to another man. Hosea was married to a prostitute. He redeemed her, but she left him and went back to prostitution. Solomon had over 700 wives and 300 concubines. If he spent each night with a different wife or concubine, it would take him almost three years before he saw all of them. And that's in the Bible. 
There are lots of stories of widows, some trying to find a way to provide for themselves in a very patriarchal society that left them little options. We see Ruth, who is widowed but stands by her mother-in-law, Naomi. We see Judah, who refuses to provide for his daughter-in-law, Tamar, forcing her into a desperate situation with desperate choices. David takes Bathsheba. He doesn't invite her into a relationship. He wants her, and so he takes her. And later, when she turns out to be pregnant with his child, he arranges for the death of her husband so that he won't be found out. Parents weren't all that perfect either. Lot offers his daughters to appease a violent mob. Moses was essentially a foster kid whose foster parents later turn on him. Eli was a faithful priest, but his sons were not. Their disobedience and unfaithfulness to God is so great that God decrees that the priestly line will no longer continue through Eli and his offspring, and instead it moves to Samuel. There is all sorts of family dysfunction and drama recorded in the Bible, and some of it gives Jerry Springer and reality TV a run for its money in terms of drama. In fact, I contend that most soap opera um, storylines uh, originated in scripture. Pretty much all of them happened. There's a predominant theory in psychological circles today that's called family systems. And family systems uh, searches for the causes of behavior, not just in an individual, but within the interactions of the members of a group. The theory starts with several assumptions, the first being that people do not exist in a vacuum, and we all know that to be true, right? We live and play and go to school and work with other people. And so in order to understand ourselves and others, we have to understand how these groups or families operate. The basic rationale is that all parts of the family are interrelated, and that means that the family has properties of its own that can be known only by looking at the relationships and interactions among all of its members. So family systems theory teaches that each family is unique because there is an infinite number of personal characteristics and cultural and ideological styles. It teaches that the family is an interactional system whose component parts are constantly shifting, shifting boundaries and shifting degrees of resistance to change. And so families have to fulfill a variety of functions for each member if each member is to grow and develop. And it teaches us that families pass through developmental and non-developmental changes that produce varying amounts of stress among its members. So let me give you an example of how you might see that played out in the life of a family. You can take something as seemingly simple as a change in working hours and look at how uh, it has implications for the relationships of everybody else in the family. So for instance, if a father is suddenly changed to the day shift on his job after working for years at night, it changes all of the rest of the interactions in the systems. So what happens when he is there in the evening to interact more closely with other family members? Will his children see his increased attention as interference in the already established patterns that they have? And if they object to that change, he might interpret that as a lack of respect or rejection. On the other hand, the father may see problems that he has not noticed before because he was home during hours that, that the children were in school. His wife may have become involved in evening activities that she may not want to give up to be with him. She may resist his involvement with the children after enjoying her own set of rules without him over the years. He might decide that it would be best to immerse himself in TV or outside activities as a way of avoiding all of the issues that have been there all along, but suddenly he sees because of the increased opportunity for closeness. Does any of that sound familiar? Do you see how each person and each event affects the whole rest of the system? Now, I love family systems because it stresses that the choices that we make and the choices we don't make affect the people around us. It doesn't allow for just one person to be at fault and for us to point the finger at one issue or one problem, but rather it asks us to kind of zoom out and look at the bigger picture. By the way, there are some very interesting studies done that say that family systems theory can be applied to churches and the way that they operate as well, but that's a whole other sermon series. So what do we do with this theory, and how do we see that applied in Scripture? Well, I want to take it back to the passage that we just read. This passage from 2 Samuel is just a part of the story about King David's family. King David is said to be a man after God's own heart, but his family is one of the most dysfunctional families in the Bible. Or maybe it just seems that way because there is more written about his family than any other, so we have more information. But 
Either way. The passage that was read for us picks up at the end of the book, and kind of at the end of um, David's family's story. So let's go back a little bit. David was the youngest son of Jesse. When Samuel, the prophet, was sent by God to anoint one of Jesse's sons king, Jesse didn't even bother to bring David with him. He brought all of his other good, tall, good-looking sons, but left David tending his sheep. Eventually, David is called in from the field and anointed in front of his brothers. You can imagine how all of them took it. The youngest one, anointed king. He eventually becomes king. He marries several wives and has many children. Scripture tells us that he had at least 19 sons born of his seven legitimate wives. That doesn't count the daughters or the children from his concubines. Now, one of his sons, Amnon, raped his sister Tamar, and we're told that David found out about it and was furious, but we aren't told whether or not David did anything about it. There's certainly no punishment for it noted in Scripture. Amnon and Tamar's brother Absalom, who's the one that we read about, found out about what happened. Absalom understandably harbors a grudge against Amnon, and years later, he plants a, tra- plants a trap and murders Amnon for what he did to their sister. As a result of that, Absalom flees the country, and when David finds out, Scripture tells us that he mourns the death of his son Amnon. Absalom was in exile for several years, and David missed him. Scripture tells us that David longed to go to him because he was consoled concerning uh, Amnon's death. Sorry, my, uh, my script went away for a minute there. Eventually, David does send for Absalom, sends for him in exile, allowing him to come back to the country, but David refuses to see him. So in other words, he allows him home, but he does not allow him back into the royal household. They live for two years that way before David finally agrees to see him. David forgives Absalom and welcomes him back into the royal household. But no sooner has David forgiven him for murder than Absalom begins to turn people against his father. And that's where we picked up today in 2 Samuel. Absalom is standing by the city gate where people are coming in and out to do business and request an audience with the king to take their concerns before him. And it tells us that anytime people have a complaint against the king, Absalom stirs the pot. He basically inserts himself into any side of discontent or conflict and works to make that discontent even bigger. Does that sound familiar at all? Many of us have people like that in our families, right, who just stir up the drama to keep it going. And almost every church and every group has a few individuals like that. Scripture tells us that Absalom was handsome, and he uses his good looks and his charm to win people's support and to turn them against his father David. At this point, Absalom has already proven that he's pretty patient, right? He was willing to bide his time to wait in exile, plotting his next move, and we know that he's cunning, that he is longing for power and prestige, While Absalom eventually succeeds in raising an army against his father and forcing King David to flee the city. But David has a lot more battle experience than Absalom, and his men are seasoned fighters against Absalom's inexperienced rebel army. David inserts a spy into Absalom's army, sabotaging his plans to usurp David's throne. And then David sets a trap for Absalom, but he tells his army to deal gently with Absalom. Even though he has done some terrible things, killing his brother and causing discontent in the kingdom, trying to overthrow David and bringing civil war, even though he's done all of that, David still cares for Absalom. When David finds out that his son was killed in the attack against the rebel army, Scripture tells us that David mourns Absalom's death deeply. He was shaken and he weeps. He tears his clothes and cries out, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died instead of you. Talk about family dysfunction, right? This is one of those cases where fiction can't be any more complicated than reality. David, a man after God's own heart, has an incredibly dysfunctional family. Yet God promises that David's line will always sit on the throne. That through David's line, the Messiah will come. If you look at it in truth, there is not one person at fault in David's family for the dysfunction. Because they all affect one another by their decisions. And the world around them affects their family. I think they would have benefited greatly from a good family systems-focused therapy. 
looking at David's family and the families that I know, I'm reminded, as the writer of Ecclesiastes said, that there is nothing new under the sun. Our families might not be as complicated or as dysfunctional as David's, or maybe they are, but none of us have perfect families. Our relationships and our families are complicated. And that doesn't mean we don't care about our family, right? David still loved Absalom after all that he'd done. Our relationships with our parents and our children and our siblings, our spouses, can be really complicated. We can have really good times and great joys and a deep love for them. We can also have serious wounds and hurts that can't simply be waved away with an apology, nor should they be. And yet that doesn't mean that we hate them. Our relationship with any given person never fits neatly into black and white categories. Almost every relationship we have has some good and bad in it, some joy, some hurt, some anger, some disappointment, because that is who we are as human beings. Each week during the sermon series, we're going to end by giving you one piece of practical advice for how to be a better family. So this week, my advice to you is this, and this is something I tell every couple who comes to me to get married. It takes time to learn your family. It takes time to learn your family. It takes even more time to learn your in-laws' family. If you think about it, I got married at, uh, how old were we, 20, 25, 23? We were 23. So I had 23 years to figure out how my family functioned and what my role within that family was. It, it will take me 23 years to be where I was 23 years ago when we got married to figure out Dwight's family. That's just the way it is, right? And every time your family changes, you have to relearn it. Every time a new child comes in, every time work changes, or you move, or a transition happens, retirement, for example, you have to relearn your family and your role within it. And I think if you take that kind of attitude into the way you function in your family, then it's much easier to adjust to the changes that occur naturally. Let me give you one more little tidbit. How many of you are the oldest child in your family? Just raise a hand. Oh, we have a lot of oldest children in here. How many of you are the middle? Smattering. Youngest? Wow, I think we have more oldest children than anybody else. That's very interesting. Hmm. So uh, if you know anything about um, birth order, you might have uh, learned this in psychology class, maybe in school. Um, they look at, psychologists look at birth order and kind of um, figure out how most uh, people are in their birth order. So firstborns, you tend to be reliable and conscientious and structured and cautious and controlling and achievers. Uh, we call my oldest sister the perfect one in love, of course, right? Any firstborns guilty of those things that I've named? You don't want to admit it, that's fine. Middle children, you tend to be, we tend to be, people pleasers, somewhat rebellious, we thrive on friendships, have large so social circles, and we tend to be peacemakers. Any of those things feel a little bit true? Youngest children tend to be fun-loving and uncomplicated, a little bit manipulative, outgoing, attention seekers, and uh, sometimes self-centered. Now, I think there is some truth to this because we do change as our family changes. So if you're um, the middle child and a baby is born, that changes your role within the family, right? You go from being the youngest to a middle, and that changes the way you operate within your family. I always tell people, uh, I think there is some truth in that, but there are also some things that don't fit, right? And in my family, since there's so many of us, the birth order thing kind of gets a little messed up. There's eight of us, and I'm number two of eight. So I always tell people that I'm a middle child with oldest child tendencies. So I kind of fit two categories. Now, maybe not all of the descriptions are accurate 100% of the time, but I think the trick is to not let yourself be defined by that description and not to be too upset by that description, because some of them are not very nice things that we've said about you, but rather to recognize which of those things is true in you and figure out how to use that to your advantage, how to use it in a positive way in your life. So if you're a middle child and you are a peacemaker, learn to use that in your work, to take advantage of it in your ministry, but be aware of the times that you have that, woe is me, I'm the middle child, everybody forgets about me kind of attitude, right? If you're a youngest child and you're fun-loving, learn to use that to help those around you be fun, but be aware of the times when you're seeking attention and guard against it. 
If you're the oldest child and you have those leadership skills that it talked about, then use them. But be aware of the times that you hold people to a higher standard than you need to. Now, we're going to talk about siblings in a few weeks and the way that some of that birth order works, and we'll probably talk about it a lot more. But I want you to think about this in the week to come. What is your place in your family? What roles do you normally play? And how might God want to use you to bring grace and love to your family system? Every family has some level of dysfunction in it and some scandal. Even Jesus' family did. Next week, we're going to spend some time looking at Jesus' genealogy and the people listed within it and their stories. And we're going to go into detail about how that works within the life of Christ. But for now, I want you to remember that God used their dysfunction to heal our brokenness. And God can use yours too. In the name of the one who created, redeems, and sustains us. Amen.